Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We're your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I'm Leora. And I'm Devani. And our guest today is a lifestyle entrepreneur and author of a book by that title, Lifestyle Entrepreneur, Live Your Dreams, Ignite Your Passions, and Run Your Business from Anywhere in the World by Jesse Krieger. 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 It's sorry. Krieger. Yeah. I said that multiple times before this, and I got it wrong. I'm sorry. That's okay. Now everyone remembers Krieger. <laughs> Jesse Krieger's lifestyle entrepreneur is the result of having lived a non-traditional life. In his 20s, Jesse launched five businesses and sold the last two. He toured America in a rock band and has flown around the world to serve as a professional dating coach. Jesse traveled to and lived in over 25 countries, learning the local languages while there, has friends around the world, and strong family ties at home. Jesse is living the life he's always dreamed of, and now one of his passions and his newest business, helping authors live their dreams of successfully publishing and launching their books through his company, Lifestyle Entrepreneurs Press, which focuses on personal development, entrepreneurship, and self-help and healthy lifestyles. So welcome. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. It's quite an introduction there. (laughs) Well, we are... We're avid entrepreneurs, as are you, and so we're very interested to hear how you got started with building, what was it, five companies by the time in your 20s? Yeah, five businesses in your 20s. Sure. I mean, uh, really, the story starts with music, and you know, I think, as you mentioned briefly in the introduction there, uh, but what I'd expand on is, you know, from a very young age, 13, 14 years old, uh, my dad gave me a Fender Stratocaster guitar, and and he himself was a musician in his younger, younger days. And I just took to it right away. I really fell in love with music, with rock music, with guitar in particular. And, and fortunately had a, you know, an encouraging father and and family that was like, yeah, we'll go for it if you love that. So honestly, throughout high school, my focus was much more on being in bands, learning Jimi Hendrix songs, playing guitar, all of that fun stuff. But (coughs) my vision was to, do it professionally and to really have, you know, a band and, and everything that entailed. It didn't happen overnight, but um, after high school, I went to Los Angeles to Los Angeles Music Academy, mm-hmm. threw myself into learning more about the harmony and theory side and really was just playing like 12 hours a day. Um, at that time, you know, playing in bands in, in LA, you actually had to pay the club owners or guarantee a certain number of ticket sales in order to get a spot to play. So it's sort of the opposite of being a professional musician, like an expensive hobby. Um, And then after that, you know, at that school, there was like 80% of the student body was international. So I got exposed to, you know, people from all over the place, Europe, Japan, Asia, South America, India. And it opened my eyes to like, wow, it's a big world. And, you know, I kind of like to see more of it. Um, So after music school, I had the invitation to go travel in Europe for a couple months with some of my friends from growing up. So sure enough, I packed a mini backpacker guitar and set off and was traveling and living in hostels and really enjoying, you know, that summer after 12 months of just studying music every day. And, you know, at this time as well, it seemed like a very distant dream to be a professional musician. But on that trip, I met somebody uh, is actually a street musician, another American who'd been living in Europe for like, seven or eight months playing in small bars and clubs, even on the streets. And I was like, wow, you're like really doing it. So it planted a seed. And these are things I've only pieced together in hindsight, but I'm sharing the key moments on that journey. And towards the end of that trip, uh, we were in, it was the last night before heading back to Paris and flying home. We were in Nice, France and came out of a, a bar late at night and some locals decided to start a fight. Ended up, it was one of the only times I've really been in a fight in my life, but pretty much got our butts kicked and 
Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured, but I remember walking back to the hostel that night, bruised, honestly bloodied. It was pretty bad thinking this can't be how it ends. Like, what am I going to do? Go back and move in with my parents. So then I was like, well, what if I stayed and linked up with the guy I met in, in Vienna, who was a musician, lo and behold, yeah, I actually skipped out on my ticket home. My friends didn't believe it until their train pulled away and I was still there standing on the platform. And that was a big turning point. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up moving back to Vienna and this musician, his name was Scott and I moved in together in still in a student dorm. I was like 19, 20 years old and started playing as a duo and playing on the street and turned the basement into a recording studio and started inviting musicians from the music schools in, in Vienna to record and play with us. And we'd make CDs and then sell them at student parties for like 10 euros and also buy a shopping cart full of beer for 25 cents each and sell those for a dollar. So I was like, okay, actually making a tiny bit of money with music. From there, um, I decided if I want to get serious, I need to learn about the production side. Mm -hmm. uh, so I moved to Nashville, Tennessee and went to audio engineering school. And that's when things really started to accelerate. Um, I met who became my bandmate and my first business partner, great guy named Jay Karsh. And we moved in together in Music Row. And now it was like 12 to 14 hours a day of music. We turned the house into a studio. Other musicians would pay us a few hundred dollars, up to a thousand dollars to produce a few songs. We were just writing, recording, producing, playing, learning continuously, continuously. Um, in that time, we started writing our own music. We started performing out. And that was the birth of what was my former band. It was called Harsh Krieger, uh, Jake Harsh and Jesse Krieger. Mm. So <clears throat> that's where it started to get interesting. And keep in mind, this is after six, seven years of loving music and really not thinking about business that much at all. Right. We came to a point where I realized, all right, we started to get some interest from producers, from uh, music publishing companies. And I realized if we just signed with somebody without knowing what we were doing, it was more or less getting a job, albeit doing something we were passionate about. So I saw the other route was to actually form our own record label. Mm. And basically my bandmate agreed to do it if I ran all the business. And I was like, all right, fine, let's give it a shot. So leaned on some family friends and um, formed a board of advisors started to learn more about business, incorporated uh, a company at age 21 that was our record label, only for our own band. Mm. <clears throat> Ended up being able to raise about $100,000 over five or six months wow. of just pitching and pitching and pitching. That let us record our own album. Um, and then ultimately from there, that turned into getting our music on hundreds of radio stations, um, pitched the music producers that did shows for MTV, licensed our album, ended up having nine of our 11 songs used on different shows on MTV. Wow. And ultimately, <clears throat> got a distribution deal with an imprint or a sub label from Sony, and that let us release our album. And then we ended up touring uh, the US playing shows in like 12 different states over. Um, over the year of 2005. So that arc of just following the thing I was passionate about to the point where I actually needed to learn more about business is the way that I got into entrepreneurship. And yeah. how that turned into the other businesses that uh, I ended up starting was even in the height of all of that, touring, playing shows, listening to our songs on the radio, there's something in my head that was like, I can't see myself doing this when I'm 40. Mm. But then I was like, well, if I'm not doing this, then what in the world would it be? And ultimately, uh, after a, a, year, a few years, decided to wind down the band and the label and see what else was out there. Um, so I like to say that answering that question, what else would I do if not music, is what led to taking that same interest and passion and finding ways to build a business model around it that led to um, ultimately founding or co-founding a renewable energy credits business, wow. search engine optimization and online marketing, um, ultimately a promotional products company that um, 
And, and in the course of those, as I was getting close to turning 30, I was like, I should put this down. I should write what my approach has been because a lot of people are asking and while other people are starting their careers and getting, you know, going through college, I was off doing my own thing. And, and ultimately that's what led to writing uh, my book, Lifestyle Entrepreneur, as you mentioned. Right. Well, so there's so much in that. And we love the story because you were an artist first mm -hmm. and many in our audience are creators. So artists, writers, and also creators of business, entrepreneurs. And often, as it was with you, there is a disconnect or apparent disconnect in the minds of creators relative to business mm -hmm. versus art. And I heard you say on uh, an interview with John Lee Dumas on EO Fire that um, you said that you thought that doing business was the antithesis of art and creativity, which of course wasn't true. Um, and that that led to your discovery that, you know, there was a creativity in business. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's <clears throat> absolutely the case that business is a creative act as well. I mean, I think to be an entrepreneur means bringing creativity into commerce or really finding where that intersection is. Um, because if you're just an artist and truly have no interest in business, then it's really like a hobby. Um, whereas if you want to have a career or build, you know, revenue and ultimately have uh, financial opportunities and things like that, you need to at least know enough to partner with somebody that can handle that or take it upon yourself to carve out small part of your time to understand, you know, what it takes to do business in a creative space or in any other. Um, but, what I've come to appreciate is that there is creativity in business in how you approach relationship partnerships with um, other people, not inside, say your own company, how you problem solve when you need to come up with solutions that could be a creative act. Maybe it's different than writing a song or painting or something like that. But if you can draw that connection, then, you know, I think it can start to diffuse the, um, the what's the right word like the the apathy that many creative people have towards business and just think of it as more of one and the same than like creativity is over here and business is over there and there's nothing in between absolutely and i think also a lot of times a lot of artists especially assume that the business side is too hard when really it's just about learning one thing at a time so that you increase your skill, like you were saying, at least to the point where you know how to partner with the right person who can take some of it on too. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I mean, you know, if you're using music for an example, there's incremental steps before you can even play a song. You've got to learn chords. You've got to learn fingerings. You've got to learn technique. <clears throat> just think of the same analogy where business isn't something that just is delivered on a platter and say, oh, now I understand business. There's, you know, how do you create a, a structure for a company? How do you um, hire or partner with people and align them around the vision for what you want to accomplish? How do you get partners or investors interested and create the structure and the incentive for them to support your vision in, in that creative sense and so much more. So as you, start to tackle each of those, it, it, it's, it's no longer something that's foreign and, and unknown. It just becomes part of a process that you go through in elaborating whatever that is you want to do creative, creatively yeah. and, right. and with business. Yeah, well put. Yeah. It's like um, both are the creative process. Both are the process of creating something from nothing. Yeah. When you're strumming that first note or string on the guitar, you know, in that moment in time and space, there wasn't that sound in existence, you know, and you brought it to existence with your strings, with your strum, with your voice, whatever. And it's the same with business. It's like bringing ideas to life through business yeah. or through art. You're creating a painting that didn't exist before. You know, you're manifesting from your vision of it into reality on a canvas. And it's the same with business. You're just, it's in a way it's three dimensional and it's such a good point about it. Either one, all of them have their technical aspects that we have to learn how to do first. Totally. I, I totally agree. And yeah, I mean, I think that that sums it up pretty well. Like the, the thing that I'd add to that, cause I don't want to just paint this picture that everything's 
I mean, if you read like my bio or you read the back of a book, those are highlights from yeah. years and years. Right. Within that time, there's plenty of hardship. There's plenty of self-doubt. There's plenty of times when things look like they may crash and burn. And honestly, that's part of the process too. So it's embracing all aspects of it and just thinking if your, your vision for what you want to create is bigger and supersedes the process and the difficulties that are inherent really in doing anything, um, then it's easier to not get discouraged or quit when times get tough. Yeah, and realizing that everybody that we look up to who's a success, including yourself, for people who are listening to this and like, wow, in your 20s, you had all these companies going on and you are, you already had a career in music that was pretty successful and lucrative for you. But then also realizing that behind all of that is the work that other people don't see. Like you, like when, by the time you were touring in the US and your music was on shows and radios, you had already put in years yeah. of developing yourself, developing your bandmates, learning music, just I mean, I'll tell you, in those, in that, in that band and in that first business, I don't think I've ever had bigger arguments and more emotional volatility in yeah. subsequent things that I've done. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of the creative. Pro it can be. It's often part of the creative process when it involves other people, because you're trying to find the middle ground between sometimes competing creative visions, and you're passionate about it. So. Me and my, and, and my bandmate, we would get into epic arguments about like a song or about like a part of a song or, you know, things like that. And in hindsight, it's kind of funny, but in the moment, it, it felt like so intense. And, yeah. and so that's a part of the process too. So I don't, I don't want to whitewash that like, oh, you just, you're passionate and you put in the work and everything happens. No, but yeah. I, I've always I have focused on and what I would encourage anybody watching and listening to this is to focus on creating some tangible milestones that let you actually feel like you are accomplishing something. That's so I pitched and pitched and pitched until finally we got a, the production deal that got our music on MTV. But I never go on an interview and talk about the 15 times that someone's like, no, it's just not for us. Yeah. Because who cares? <laughs> but you get that one and then that turns into something that builds momentum and builds the overall story. Absolutely. That's so I'm so glad you bring that up because and there are a couple points that you made in the previous interview um, that I listened to. One what and we have a quote that we use often around here. It is and that the quote is it is in the journey that the way becomes more clear. And the way you put that on the interview was, you know, it was like driving in fog and you know you know the general direction. You know you can mostly see the road well enough to continue, but you really can't see that far in advance and you just trust yeah. and keep on going. And the other thing you said was you said focus on consistency and in incremental gains and then on the side swing for the fences you know that was like one of your co quotes as well so it's the concept of focusing on the gains not the gaps and to keep on going um, no matter what I, I like it I'm glad that I said that in, a, in another interview <laughs> I mean I think the analogy just to share it with everyone listening is like say you're driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles at night foggy or not like you, even with your headlights on, you can't see Los Angeles from where you're starting. You know where you want to go. You know where it is. There's even a map and a road. But as long as you're moving, you continue to see the signs and you see the mile markers tick down. If you just sit still, then all you can see is what's immediately in front of you. So that's really the value of continuing to move forward is that the next steps and the milestones and everything reveal themselves in that process. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. And that's so important for so many creatives, just because a lot of our work comes from processing those moments of doubt. Um, yes. We're running an artistic challenge in our group right now, and a lot of people are creating things through contemplating some of the challenges they've been through. And that's, that's part of the creativity of art, like learning to process the the downhills in life, but that can also create some of the wins because once yeah. you process it and get to the other side, you then have some work that you could say, hey, I grew from this experience and now you can grow from viewing it or hearing it or whatever. Yeah. And along those lines, let me just go back in time for a moment because you were, you said you were 21 when you started the record label, right? And raised the money from family and friends. And what year was that? 
That was 2003. Okay, so that was- Two or three. So that was before so many of the resources that creators now have readily at their fingertips. Like you said, MTV. I mean, there was no YouTube, right? There was, I don't remember. I think that was, was, no, no. I mean, yeah. when we were in the band 2004, that was the very beginning of Facebook, but they were only on college campuses. Right. And right. I'll quick fun story that yeah. wouldn't happen now, but. I was aware of Facebook. We had our band stuff on MySpace. And I remember pitching Facebook on co-branding a college tour. Wow. I actually pitched and got, I have an email somewhere from Sean Parker, who was then the president of Facebook, saying it's a good idea. We're just focusing on, you know, building out Facebook on more campuses now, so we can't focus on it. Yeah. Wow. But, and then, you know, th that story is only cool because look at, how big it's grown yeah. but like so I, I guess I, I, if there's a takeaway from that it's like look at what other people that are in complementary spaces are doing and try and see who are the ones that are also passionate and that have a vision if you can align with them it only takes you know a couple wins on that front to get momentum and to to skip some of the steps yeah yeah definitely and so then how did you say so so you so tell us a little bit more about the story of publishing your book lifestyle entrepreneur sure so you know if we fast forward towards um uh in, around 2008 or so i read a book called the four hour work week which people <laughs> are probably familiar with yes. um, and it's still popular now right but the, the concept i got from that is you can build a business that has a virtual structure meaning you know technology was advanced enough at that point you could hire and manage people through online talent platforms. You could find customers and deliver products, even physical products that were produced in one place, sent to somewhere else, and you're over here, not even in the bottleneck of that. So that idea really struck me. And I, at that point, had an opportunity and an idea to start a promotional products business that had that virtual structure. So. It was called USB Superstore. And we had like three or four different manufacturers in Asia and had an online, you know, a website targeted on businesses that were buying wholesale flash drives for promotional uses, for conferences, universities to give out to students or to faculty. And so it was a business to business type of, uh, of company. And ultimately, all we needed was like 10 or so customers a month to generate five figures of revenue and just to manage the process um, that you know, there's quality control on the production, ship directly to the end customer, and that we could reach new customers online. And that allowed me to travel quite a bit uh, once it was up and going and also had me back and forth to Asia and China in particular. So as I've been wont to do, I was got interested in Chinese language and culture and started studying the language. One thing led to another and I really sort of went all the way with it. I spent years studying Mandarin. Wow. It was after I sold USB Superstore, I realized that was when I started writing the book. Um, and I had some friends in Asia who had written books and one of them introduced me to his publisher and I pitched him with my book idea and they were interested. So I agreed to go over and like tour around and speak at book fairs and stuff like that. So when my book, when Lifestyle Entrepreneur first came out, it came out in Malaysia, Singapore and like Southeast Asia. It's not an Amazon book. There wasn't even a digital version. Yeah. It was shaking hands, signing books and kissing babies, I like to say. <laughs> but I, I saw and the opportunity was to be sort of like a, a bigger fish in a smaller pond. I think U.S. is the biggest market in the world. So it'd be a tougher sell as a first time author to get a publisher and and do that. So through that process, it, it became the number two business bestseller in that region. And I knew that that was my intro to getting a U.S. publisher, which I ultimately did. And that's the version most people know now. Um, and so going through that process as an author and working with two different publishers is surprise. What gave me I, the idea 
yes. to start yes. a publishing company that works with authors the way that I believe a publishing company should. Well, yes. that's a great point. And we have listened to some of your interviews going into that and on your website, but for our listeners and audience, can you tell us the gap that your publishing company fills that many don't? Sure. I mean, I think most authors want personal attention, marketing support, um, and you know somebody to get behind what they're doing and partner with them. Whereas most publishers are much more in the business of acquiring rights and selling books and paying minimal, really, if anything, to authors. And let alone, you know, having like a long-term partner with a personal relationship. So in, in that gap, I saw the opportunity and we only work with, you know, 20 to 25 authors a year, but we work with them for six, seven, eight months or so from where their manuscript is almost done or written through the editing, design, layout, marketing, pre-launch, all the way through to publication. And then after publication, we continue to support them. So, you know, I think, well, I, I believe people have responded well to it as for the first three, four years, the company grew sort of doubled in size each year. And now we're at a, a new sort of turning point that I'm still adjusting to. We've gotten a new distribution deal with uh, Ingram Publisher Services, which is like the largest book distributor. And I'm coming to grips with having grown up within this business to a, we can play on a bigger playing field and support authors in, a, in an even bigger way. So, you know, whatever starts as an idea or an opportunity, and then you take action, it is that incremental process. Each book got our focus and attention. Each author tried to really establish a relationship and get them talking to other people. Hey, you know, these guys are doing cool stuff and they've really supported me. That generates more interest and, and one thing leads to another. Like we really don't do paid advertising or, or, uh, or much. I, I come on and talk about what we do and I love doing media and interviews like this. Um, but then that builds an interest and a momentum that, you know, as we were talking about in other endeavors, it's, it's that incremental process. Now I can come on to a show and say we've published over 50 books, um, whereas a few years ago, it was a different angle because it was an earlier stage. So it was more about like the focus and attention. It was more about creativity and design and having great looking covers. Yeah. Which I'll show off a few like this one, our team did yeah. the hand drawn cover design. Lily wow. Barlow by Carla. Brazil. Looks like inside yeah. and we're looking to, so people go if people will search on Amazon lifestyle entrepreneurs press. They'll come up with, you know, several dozen of your covers and they're all very impressive looking. We love the full color life cover with the splashes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, well, no, that was a sponsor. That's oh, a, sorry. Yeah, that's a sponsor. It's right under that. So dream training, uh, superhuman entrepreneur, author, authorpreneur. Those are yours, right? Yeah, some of those. Yeah, some of those. Um, the thing is, here's the thing with like a publishing company is if we do our job right, we're kind of invisible. I mean, we right. do our, our focus is on authors, Yes. but I don't, most people don't buy a book because of who published it. Mm -hmm. I think they yeah. buy it because they're interested in learning something. They're interested in overcoming a problem or getting insight on an issue they're dealing with and or being entertained. Yeah. So I don't know if you can search for Lifestyle Entrepreneurs Press on Amazon and see our books, but... Yeah. And yeah, maybe you can. Yeah. yeah, that's what we did. And um, I clicked on it. There, there are some ads that come up that where they're using, I guess, your uh, name as a keyword so that they come up uh, in that search result, even if they weren't. Uh, but so lifetime. So here's an example. Um, Limitless women empowering the next generation of legacy. But but people can search Amazon. I mean, 
with that term, Lifestyle Entrepreneurs Press, to see a good example of a lot of your collection, as well as go to your website for sure, which of course we'll link to in this podcast, lifestyleentrepreneurspress.com, which you have some great information, a beautiful website, and some a great intro video. Um, so, so one of the things that so many people, like if they've never published a book before, um, of course they're, they're going through the modern yeah. the modern dilemma is do i try and go through a publisher and many people still have in their mindset trying to be accepted by a publisher and others are at the place where they think well probably i want to self-publish but then i won't have any prestige so it's like when they go through you you are a publisher now right so so therefore they're not self-publishing if they go through you and yet they have a lot more control and a lot more profit than if they were to go through a the old school publishing firm, right? Would you like to expand on any of that? Sure. I mean, the first thing I'd say is it's never been easier than today to self-publish. But what comes along with that is a lot of kind of half-assed books that only sell a handful of copies because, you know, if you're self-publishing and, and it's possible to be successful, I have friends that have, have done well with self-publishing, but what it entails is learning a new skill set doing a lot more stuff than just writing the book. I mean, and you, and the things that you have to do are what other companies, publishers like us and others are doing 24 seven with experienced teams. So in addition to writing a good book, it's also learning a skill set and trying to do something at a level of quality the first time that other people do as a career. And I think that's the big issue. Whereas on, on the other end of the spectrum with traditional publishing houses, you don't even necessarily need to write the book first. You got to do a proposal and get an agent and pitch. And that's when you hear like, I was turned down by 30 publishers. Well, that's what it takes if you want to go that route, hopefully to get an advance. But almost every author I've talked to that's traditionally published that's gotten advance, I say, is that the only money you've ever seen from the book? And most of them think about it for a second and go, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, if you sell even a lot of books, you've got to recoup that advance against like 10% or so of sales. And that requires a lot of book sales to get into the black and receive more money. So our model is different in the sense that we have a, a service fee to work with authors for the six to nine months that it takes to do all the editing, design, layout, marketing, etc., as well as building their platform and advising on you know, how does this book play into your broader business and your brand? And on the back end, we do a publishing partnership where we do 50% of net royalties. So self-publishing, you could keep it all. Traditional, you get barely anything. With us, you invest into uh, a team that's worked with now, you know, dozens and dozens of authors and stand to gain much more, you know, for each book sold. But more importantly, I think, or most importantly, is that we always try and look at a book as a business development tool. It's not just in isolation. We're okay, the book's done and it's out. It's okay if you want to be speaking, if you're a coach, if you're doing retreats, if you have online training course, if you have masterminds. That book should really help enroll people into whatever else it is you're doing professionally. Because just think about your own experience. You know, if you've read a book where somebody's sharing, personal story, useful strategy, applicable advice, you probably think, you know, like you know them. And then to have the chance to actually work with them, it makes it a much easier, it actually makes it less of a sales process and more of qualification. Is this, is this person the right fit to work with me? Also, great way to get on media. I mean, I've yeah. done, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 interviews, mostly because of my own book and now more so because of our work with authors. So it's a great way to get your name out there and get in front of new audiences and to attract the kind of clients that you probably really want to work with. And like what you were mentioning when you self publish completely on your own, you get 100% of your book sales, but at the same time that's being divvied up from the costs of the platforms you're on. So Amazon takes their cut, you know, you have to pay your editor. So you're still 
working with a company like yours, where it's sort of like publisher slash marketing slash branding, you have more of a chance to kind of look at your book as a brand and business, as opposed to let me just publish this thing and hope it sells and hope I can get into a publisher and that cycle, which isn't necessarily the most. Yeah, sadly, hope doesn't make for good marketing. Whenever <laughs> I hear somebody say, I'm just going to put it on online and see what happens. <laughs> well, usually not much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because there's, I mean, people just aren't combing through unknown authors and books looking for something interesting to read. You discover a book through different ways, through recommendations, through doing a search for something and another book pops up because people are sponsoring an ad next to it. Mm -hmm. That's fair game. We do that to other books for our titles. But I think the takeaway is that no matter what approach you go to publishing, it's not free. Self-publishing isn't free. It just means that you pay in different ways and you... Yeah. You know, you have to work through that process. Traditional publishing isn't for either. Even if you get an advance, every deal I've ever seen requires the author to buy it like a few thousand copies mm -hmm. at a markup over print cost. So mm -hmm. however you, however they describe it, you're still going to be paying in many cases, thousands of dollars for that contract. For us, I think it's just more transparent and honest to say you're paying us for professional services. And the result of that is a publishing partnership when your book's in the market. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a great model. When you work with, I noticed on your website, so you focus a lot on self-development, uh, self-development authors, entrepreneurs, and um, wellness, those types of things, those types of books and genres that do lend themselves well to brands and building brands or companies around them. I did notice you had a fiction book on your Facebook page. Do you work are you guys getting into more fiction? Do you do yeah, that? Yeah, we've done uh, maybe four or five fiction titles at this point. It's, it's something that I'm interested in and dipping our toe into. What I've found out is it's a very different um, ball game. Yeah. That being said, fiction as a genre sells way more books than nonfiction. And fun fact, like romance and erotica is probably the top selling genre of them all. Uh, we don't, we don't play in that space, but it's, it's just kind of eye opening when you think like, you know, when I think about books that have made an impact in my life, think and grow rich, yes. how to win friends and influence people. Yeah. Those are very well selling nonfiction books, but you know, 50 yeah. Shades of Grey, Harry Potter, stuff like that blows the roof off with sales. Yes. Um, and so anyways, you know, with fiction, we, we want to play and we've got a few books that, that I'm passionate about and are, the authors are passionate about. And it's just a nice counterbalance to working with more like, yeah, business, self-help and spiritual type of titles. Yeah. And I think so one thing um, that many people who have not yet embarked on any kind of publishing schedule uh, or approach or program or most people don't know that even if you're established enough in your own platform and in your career to sort of win or get bequested in advance most of that is supposed to intended to go toward your own marketing of your own book because again unless you're like a prominent personality JK Rowling. yeah the the publishing firm is, the company is not going to do promotion for you mm -hmm. uh, you still have to do all of that yourself yourself you still have to show up um yeah go ahead. oh yeah that's i mean that's i'm glad you brought that up because no matter which if you go self-publishing inherently you're the you're the person you're the person marketing your book if you go traditional, you're also the person marketing your book. If you publish with us, you're also the person marketing your book. Now, in our case, we do promotion for our authors. We run ads. I'll interview them and turn that into like a Facebook video post and YouTube and stuff. We'll work on getting them on media and PR and so forth. But at the end of the day, you know, if I grab any book, I'm not on this book cover. It's Lily Barlow by Carla Vergat, right? I'm not on this book cover. It's Inside by Sarah Bersard. So again, like the publisher can do only so much, yeah. but as the author, it really is your prerogative to be the most vocal advocate and get out there and, um, and work on behalf of your book, meaning pursuing opportunities like this, speaking, whatever it is that lines up with your topical focus. Um, you have every 
every benefit in doing so and like no benefit by just hoping or thinking that somebody else is going to do it on your behalf. Yeah. I can't make somebody else famous if they don't want to get out and, and work for it too. Right. Um, but if we point. line up our, our energies then, and each of us sort of stay in our lane. That's where really great things can happen. And that's such a good point too. Cause I think sometimes some creatives get frustrated thinking, Oh, I just need the right shout out or I just need the right, other person to leverage popular, but it's sort of like, you really just have to kind of get out there yourself and do a lot of it. Like your, your guys' role is more helping them position themselves to do that. And so that they're prepared for any outcomes from all the marketing. Yeah. I think that's, sorry, go ahead. You're going to say, uh, I was just going to say that, you know, it sort of brings it full circle from it, in the music space. Trust me, musicians more than authors, said, if I just got a record deal, all my problems would be solved. Yeah. But I've actually looked at record deals. And when we were getting closer to a point where we could have perhaps gotten one, I realized what that actually meant. And it's not a be all end all by any stretch. In fact, it's a contract that obligates you to multiple albums and a lot of other stuff in, in almost every case. So, you know, there's no magic pill. There's no Thing where you can just wave a wand and bypass doing the work. But when I say doing the work, you should think of it as fun. Like I enjoy coming on and having conversations like this. I enjoy doing creative approaches to getting my name and our author's names out there. And if you can embrace that the same way that you embrace the artistic and creative side of whatever it is you're working on, then you've got the best chance at actually building a career and having longevity and more opportunities appear before you. Absolutely. And we, in fact, it ties in with what we were talking about earlier about the business side of creativity and creating, um, you know, it, it's like the, it's like the right step, you know, it's like left, right, left, right. One is, is needed for the other. Um, and many, many writers and authors, when they finish their manuscript, they feel like their job is done, but really that's just the first half. You know, the next half really is all about the promoting and getting out there. And that's sort of like, if you, but if you want your work to make its way in the world, you know, it's like your child, you don't, you know, have a child and then send it off unguided you know unsupervised without your your being a part of that journey so i mean a couple you touched on a couple of things there that that i like you know when you finish writing the book that is a big milestone and honestly there's only two major components to publishing writing the book and everything else yeah. <laughs> and you know it, it's funny but it's also actually very true like if you don't have the book then there's nothing to publish. There's nothing to promote. There's nothing to market. There's nothing to talk about on media. So there's a whole art to this that maybe is fuel for a separate conversation to how to actually write a great book. Yes. And, and it's a process for sure. You know, it's not like uh, other forms of art where you could in one sitting do a painting and when you're done, you're done. Right. You can't sit down and write a book in one sitting. So you have to embrace the process. Um, but then when you're done, it is shifting gears where now the other thing you mentioned, like giving birth, look, I've never gone through it myself, but you're incubating, something's growing inside of you. And at a certain point it matures and now it's out in the world and takes on a life of its own. Um, it's very much the case with a book where once it's done and it's out, once you publish, that's the first time that somebody else in the world can find, discover, read, and love what you've created. And a lot of people, sadly, sh short circuit their own process right before the finish line. You write a whole book and, and even as it's getting ready to come out, they're just like, oh, what's the point? Or like, I'm not gonna do it, or self-worth issues, or this or that, and sabotage what could just be that turning point where you know, one of the most rewarding parts of being an author was getting letters and hearing from people and reading reviews, people I've never met in places I've never been saying I've had a positive impact on their life and inspired them to do something different. That only comes if you cross that threshold and actually get it out into the world and give it that initial push, then yes, it can build momentum. It can sell on its own. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but you do have to get the ball rolling and, and build some momentum with it. 
I had one question. Have you guys ever, with the, any of the authors you've worked with, have you helped, has anybody come to you with a book they've already published, but they want, they either have the rights back or they self-published it themselves, but then they wanted to do like a relaunch or a revival? Have you helped with that process? We've done a handful of those. Um, what it will generally require is doing an, an updated expanded edition or a second edition. What we can't do, and there's really no point in doing, is just taking the same book and, and us publishing it. Right. So it's got to be packaged up as something new or that there's something exciting and different. And then, you can, and then we should also put a marketing plan behind it yeah. so that it gets a new push and a new life. But yeah, that's, that is, that's one way to go. And sometimes I, I entertain those. Yeah, no. So, and going back to the birthing analogy, you know, this is not to scare away any new and prospective authors any more than it would be to scare away prospective new parents. Yeah, rather, right. <laughs> rather it is to understand that the process of the birthing is just the beginning, you know, really, and, and, or the next stage, part two, and then the rest of it is everything else, as you indicated. Um, and really it's, it's like, again, like, you started out saying embracing the journey um, and recognizing that one thing will lead to the next and you can never know all that it will lead to. But if you write the book and then work to get it into the world, this is the thing. This is the journey that so many artists and entrepreneurs struggle with. And that is, well, hey, but, but I'm not getting paid or I'm not making anything on that. And that's the thing with artists, creators, musicians, entrepreneurs, we have to work for a long time, oftentimes a long time, building, yeah. constructing, growing this creature, this being, whatever it may be, before we actually, it can actually support us. Yeah. Well said, you know, and, and it's an important thing to mention because I don't want to get on here and give anybody a false idea that even in six months or a year that you can go from like a standing start to being well-known and, and well-received and making money and so forth. Like in any business I've, I've been involved in, it's, it's a process that usually extends beyond a year, sometimes more, before there's actually some resulting surplus or, or benefit or profit and so forth that makes it more self-sustaining. So like with, and in creative industries for sure, whether that's music, art, books, films, there's what's called a, a power distribution curve where the people at the top of that curve are making a lot, right? A Jackson Pollock painting or a box office smash or a New York times bestseller is selling a exponentially larger number of books than that longer tail. So it's just something to be aware of where like, I think creative industries are, are hit businesses inherently as a publisher. I know that one or two out of 10 books is going to sell multiple, a multiple of the other books and hopefully three to four do pretty, pretty well and for better or worse. And for whatever reason, you know, four to five may break even or just really not do that well at all. I want them all to do well. I want all of our authors to succeed. I want every book we publish to do well. And that's the energy I bring to it, but it's not just up to me. So <laughs> That's how it shakes out with the numbers. And it's something to be aware of, like create more art, do, do the next thing. If something isn't working, don't try and beat a dead horse for two years, create something new, do something else. And as you do, eventually you'll stumble across something that becomes that milestone or an achievement or a real accomplishment. So yeah. And I think that's super important. Like we were talking about this the other night. It's sort of like when it comes to books, like we've been talking about, you have to write the book for there to be something to promote. And that can be a hard thing for an author because you can't do it in one sitting, but with a painting, you can, you can like without paintings pretty quickly. And it might not be your, you know, Mona Lisa, you know, but you can do it pretty quickly. But with, when it does come to writing the book, it's like you have to set like these daily intentions, milestones, and celebrate those milestones and then realize that there's a lot of work afterwards to bring to the table, no matter if you self publish or go with a publisher or go with a marketing 
slash publishing company like you have as an author people are connecting with you the author not the publisher behind the author yeah that's right but yeah. but as a publisher i've made a point to get out and and be a voice on behalf of authors you know everywhere and and in particular the ones that we've worked with um there's something else you mentioned i wanted to speak to yeah the consistency it so you build the cum, the cumulative nature of working your art like a process which may not be sexy it may not be what people want to hear but i'm working on my next book now it's actually called the art of creation nice. which is all about turning ideas into reality and creating your life and the things you want in it consciously um, but also through a process i wake up every morning and five days a week I drink a cup of coffee and I write 750 to a thousand words. Mm. I'll be honest. It's easier for me now after publishing 50 books and seeing all the ups and downs and all arounds of the author experience to do that. Five, six, seven years ago when I was starting to write my book, it was much more of a uphill battle because I was learning how to do it while I was doing it. Right. So that it's, just something to, to think about as a creative that you, you like, you sharpen your ax and, and you get the skills and eventually you've got something where you can swing it once and chop down the tree. Um, I don't know if that's the best analogy, but a, an artist that's painted a hundred paintings, the hundred and first painting presumably is going to be much more of an easy creative process than the first five or 10. Absolutely. Well, yeah. and it's like, it really just as you, as we've been talking, it occurs to me that anything worth doing goes through this process. Yeah. Like any, you know, and that, you know, Business again, too. again, right. Whether it's parenting, whether it's the journey from LA to San Francisco or East coast to West coast. Um, or like if you're, so if your parents back to the parenting analogy, there's all this excitement when there's, when the conception happens and there's all this hoopla and then there's all this excitement, you know, during the birth. And then the parents have these long, hard nights, oftentimes, of sleepless nights, et cetera. And then you're like, oh, 18 years of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I mean, so there, it's like the roller coaster of life, essentially. And that's really the journey of anything. And I think that you mentioned something, Devani, the other day. It's the concept of we've been working in our own entrepreneurial journey um, in such a crazy, you know, like intense fashion that we finally kind of re started relaxing into it. It's sort of like you relax into it rather than yeah. have, be, have this urgency about it, but you recognize that that's what it entails and that's what, what it's all about. And you relax into making sure you enjoy the journey and know that that's what it is and know that you can't know everything that's going to happen along the way, but you can know the next step, the next few miles ahead, and you proceed in that direction. And I, and I think that when it comes to, so, so I'd like to ask a couple other things before we let you go, if you have time. And that is the concept of, well, two things. One is for nonfiction writers. If you're a business person um, seeking to grow your career and or your service offerings, if you're a service oriented um, professional, it's almost like, you know, we've heard the saying that the book is a new business card. It's almost like, you know, that's a door opener. That's what helps you get on stage. That's what, you know, even so really it's almost like, it's almost like a part of your a professional journey. So there's that, if you could speak to that in a moment. And then the other side, the next question to ask after is like, you mentioned that fiction writers, we have a lot of fiction writers in our audience and that fiction writers are, you know, it's a whole different thing for fiction books. So if there's anything you can share that you've learned on that, that would be helpful to our audience as well. Absolutely. So on nonfiction side first, I view having a book and if you do it right and hit a bestseller in your category, even for a week or so, you know, if you think of a number one hit song, a box office smash in a movie, a best-selling book, it's a moment in time when you've sold more books than anybody else in your category that carries with you actually for the rest of your life. So if you go through the process and do it right and you get that credential, it's on par with, I think in many, it's more valuable than an undergraduate degree. It's mm -hmm. probably more impressive than a master's and it's on par with like a doctorate, meaning if you watch, if tune in now to TV, to other places when people are introduced, it's either best-selling author of this or like doctor or so it becomes a professional credential or, you know, your title, like executive director of this or CEO of that. So it actually creates a professional credential that's very useful 
in business settings. Um, and many like opportunities are actually limited to authors. Like I've heard of places where if you want to speak, you more or less have to have a book in order to be considered. Mm -hmm. The value of a book in nonfiction is you can hand somebody a copy or send them an email and transmit maybe years, if not a decade plus of your experience, presenting it in the exact way you want it to be viewed and received. Um, so that's, that's one aspect there. You know, in terms of fiction, um, what I would say is, you know, fall in love with your characters, fall in love with the storyline and live it and breathe it so that when you're writing, you're, you're so in it that you almost dissolve the separation. And if you can, if your characters become like living, breathing entities, creatures that you can see in your mind and you know how they're going to react in different situations and you know how they'll interact with each other. And again, I'm not the expert on fiction, but I think that that's a big part of writing compelling stories is that when I read fiction books that I really like, I feel like I really know, I feel like they're real people or if it's like a fantasy type of thing that it's congruent, like the way that they act and behave lets me know that like who they are and what they're about and what their motivations and what their backstory is through the way that they interact with each other and through the way that the storyline unfolds. So I think it's really about getting in, in touch with, the character development and the storyline and living it and breathing it. And, and in that process, you document it and that becomes, you know, your book that becomes uh, your story. So hopefully that's yeah. helpful. And so it, that's a lovely way of describing right, the process of writing uh, the fiction where it is that so many fiction writers get very frustrated is in the selling and marketing of it because like you said, it's a whole different thing because you can easily create a page, a profile, a social post and whatever with nuggets of wisdom from the nonfiction books, mm -hmm. I know tips, etc., cetera, uh, advice, whatever with fiction. It's a little bit different. I mean, sure you can release snippets and character language and dialogue and teasers and that sort of thing, but it is a little different and it, it doesn't necessarily go in in perpetuity. And yet, so like we, and we have conversations, we have fiction writers in our family and we anguish over this. We have a lot of fiction writers in our audience and we anguish over this for them. And that is like, you can spend a year writing a fiction book. Or more because it's not like a linear methodical type training. Yeah, that's the average. So we have some that write it in a few months and some yeah. that write it in a year. And, you know, and, and yet then you might make a few cents off it here and there kind of thing. You might sell a book and you're selling a book a day, even that can be lucky. So it's like, that's the hard part. Like what have you seen or have you seen yet um, success in the fiction marketing um, arena? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> there's a book called, I think, How I Sold a Million Books in Five Months by John Locke, L-O-C-K-E. And how he did that was he's got multiple, multiple fiction books. And the whole point of it is that when somebody discovers one of his books, they like the characters, they like the writing style, then they read all of them. So if you, so as, if you dial that back, if you, maybe it takes a while to write the first one, but now you've done a lot of the groundwork, crank out a, a lot of books. Like I would probably argue that volume is better than like having two to three years in between each release. Mm -hmm. I think the top fiction writers nowadays have multiple books coming out in a year, like one a quarter, sometimes even more. Um, and so that, and, and so in that sense, and building a, a relationship with your readership, so having a, a way to either have an email or some other group or way to connect, that can build so that you get your next book, gets front run, and now they're buying that one. And if people discover book three, then they'll buy book two and one. And that way you can actually start to make money selling books as a fiction author. But uh, not but, but I mean, it, it requires consistent creative output, which yeah. surprisingly or not is what most creatives claim to want to do. I just want to create. Yeah. Oh yeah. Great. Well, crank out three books a year. Yeah. And, and if you're doing that people, you'll find people who will support you in the other parts of that process. I mean, yeah. 
if anybody's watching this and you want to tell me you're going to crank out three to four books a year, I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. that's a good amount of creative output that, you know, can be worked with from a, a publishing and business standpoint. Great. Yeah. yeah. That makes so much sense. I love that. And, and it's really like, it's like you're taking your creativity process. And, and this is of course advice for people who want to make it their career and make money off of like selling their work, which is not, a bad thing it's great and it just takes like every single day write your words so yeah. that you have a body of work that people who have the business and marketing skill can work with with you yeah and and i'm taking my own advice in the nonfiction sense i mean i'm loving writing and i did the math 750 to a thousand words a day five days a week that's like two hundred fifty thousand words a year fifty thousand words a book give or take, that's four to five books worth of content in a calendar year. So yes. I will go on the record here and say that I will be cranking out a lot more books of my own. Now that I've built a platform and have a publishing company, I already know how they're going to come to market, yes. which is great. It's a benefit of putting in the work to build that. Yeah. Well, I love how you create it. You, cre you solved a problem in the publishing marketplace, which now also helps you in your endeavors in writing a book. And so that's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. So tell us, okay, so we know that if you were to self-publish. Yeah, I'm going to, I've got maybe a few more minutes or so. Time flies when we're having fun. I know, I know. So, so we just want to end with your sharing a little bit more. Like if we were to self-publish, it could take um, three to 5,000 by the time you finish with the editors and, and the, uh, even the, the cost of the printing, even if you're going through a place like Create Space, people can come to you. Um, they can go to lifestyleentrepreneurspress.com and go through your site um, and learn more. Do you want to share any last thing about that before we go? Yeah, sure. And thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And if you've been watching or listening this far, then I hope you've gotten something valuable out of this as well. Um, if you like what I've been talking about in terms of our approach to publishing, then I believe we'll link up that address below. And I'll also provide you guys with a link where um, people can submit for a publishing consultation. That's just sharing some information about your book, your goals, and a few other things then we review those. And then if we think it's a good fit, we'll jump on the call and, uh, and explore that. So, okay. you know, in terms of how we work, um, yeah, we have a package that is in the ballpark of around $15,000 that is a fully supported um, package. And that really involves like a year of partnership. So whether or not that sounds like a big figure, just, do some of the math and research on your own end on what it would take to do it yourself and the time that that's involved. Um, but with the understanding as well that, you know, you stand to make more per book and we've got authors where we've done three books now at this point. So being in the relationship is the first milestone, but then uh, we love multi-book authors and the idea of having those long-term publishing partnerships. Definitely. Fantastic. Awesome. We love that. Thank you so much for visiting with us, Jesse Krieger. Yes. Of, all your tips. Yes. LifestyleEntrepreneursPress.com. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.